Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our weekly um, Facebook Live brought to you by Vectorical Teleneurology. We've got a great uh, topic tonight with 3D printing um, and a great speaker as well. I will come back to that. If you're not familiar with the concept, um, every week, Simon and I, we invite an expert um, in the field of neurology, and we ask a number of questions to our guests that we have already prepared. And at the end of this 20, 25 minute uh, talk, we uh, invite you to submit question um, that we can then put to our expert. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce to you Fred Winninger, who is a um, neurology diplomate from the American College. Fred is a neurology consultant working in Charlotte, North Carolina for um, a hospital called CARE, uh, but also Fred is the founder of a great company um, that is, um, can design for you 3D printing uh, for surgical planning for all this complex neurosurgery. And Fred will be able to tell you a little bit more um, about his company and how you can as well submit your city if you want Fred to design this guide for this complex neurosurgery. Um, Simon, we start by asking a number of questions to Fred, and then I will uh, invite you during that to put questions um, on the comment box that I will ask Fred at the end of his presentation. Fred, nice to meet you, and uh, thanks for giving up your time today. I think it's about 2 o'clock in the afternoon in, in Charlotte. I'm glad that both of you have, are wearing a white coat, and you can see that I don't even know where mine is. I don't even know when was the last time I wear one. Um, but yeah, I feel a little bit left out, but never mind. I never understood why in the US, you guys always put your name. Is it in case you get lost and someone can bring you back or something? My technicians forget sometimes. Yeah, they have to be reminded. I know Simon is aging and he doesn't always remember his age. <laughs> and you need you know, someone to remind him about his name. But yeah, I've always been uh, quite uh, surprised by this in the US. Is it is in is in case you know you people like you might come along and take it and obviously you could go camping in this. <laughs> I think with yours I can probably make a tent with it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so 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 then everyone would know, not your own, it's mine. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie starting to regret. Yeah. Well, not, not yet. Yet. But yeah, never mind. Simon. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you enjoy it. Yeah, uh, uh, over to me. Um, thanks, Fred, for coming on. Yeah, one of the good things about these weekly sessions that we've been doing during the lockdown is that uh, a chance to to really meet people that are pushing forward neurology in in these different areas. And and uh, so it's an honor to have you on talking about about this because this is certainly pushing us forward in the area of neurosurgery. Um, yeah, things like this are uh, even uh, make make the young Laurent feel old um so so i'm actually glad it's make, make him feel a little bit you know in, in the history books um so anyway let's get started um and the first question the obvious first question then is is what is 3d printing can you can you get us going with that sure uh, i'm going to share the screen all right if, if that's okay um and bring up this powerpoint and uh while that's happening i'll say that the you know, really the honor is all mine to be here. Um, I think the VET Oracle is um, really the future of teaching and it, it really means a lot to me to be on here, not only to share something uh, that I'm very passionate about, um, but also being able to share this with veterinarians who are uh, interested just for the sake of learning. Um, what I was sharing with uh, Simon and Laurent yesterday is I think one of the great things that's come out of this uh, epidemic, this pandemic, is that uh, all this tele, uh, teaching has really uh, shown us that um, it's not always about continuing education or getting a grade, but it's really about just advancing ourselves as uh, through our career to be the best we can be. So um, what is 3D printing? So 3D printing is really more appropriately called additive modeling. Now, traditional manufacturing is more of a subtractive or machines modeling. And so an example that I'm showing here is if you wanted to 
uh, for example, make a bust of Beethoven, originally what you would have had to do is take a large block of a substance and then basically tear away at it until you had the resultant effect. Uh, but with additive modeling, basically the principle with that is that we're going to make layer by layer, we're going to create the model from the bottom up with no waste of product. And what's exciting about that is as opposed to subtractive modeling, which requires either very sophisticated planning and equipment or very uh, personalized skills with uh, dexterous skills, uh, 3D modeling is very accessible, not only because the ease of using the machines, but also because the database with which we can um, share files. Uh, so for example, instead, if you wanted to make a bust of Beethoven, you would just opened up one of the big encyclopedias of or dictionaries of, of uh, 3D printing. For example, uh, Thingiverse is a common one, and it would automatically print on your own machine. Um, now, 3D printing has a huge precedent in the human field. And here are just some examples of it. Everything from cranioplasty and models to prosthetics, uh, prosthetic arms. Um, we even see um, implants that have biomechanical properties like intervertebral disc implants. And then some of the more exciting stuff is printing not in some of the more traditional things like plastics or acrylics, but actually printing on tissue, out tissues, printing out monolayers of cells that can develop into different tissue types. But I would propose that 3D printing has advantages in veterinary medicine that maybe make it a greater utility to our field than to the human field. Uh, one of the reasons for that is the anatomic and size variation that's inherent to our patients. Uh, so that variability means that standardized equipment, standardized tools, um, and even just general anat anatomic principles can vary so greatly that it's to our benefit to be able to have these, uh, these tools for ourselves. Um, we don't tend to do as many patients as our human field, so we can uh, print um, much more in a, in a smaller scale as opposed to printing out 100 titanium cervical plates. We could print one or two which fit our individual needs. Um, limited longevity. So when we're talking about potential for implants, our animals don't need to live as long. And so the variety of things that we can use in our animals is probably greater than it is in humans because we don't have to worry about them lasting as long. And then lastly is device costs. So in the absence of having um, things like insur uh, the, the level of insurance and the funding that goes into the human field, uh, we really need things to be as inexpensive as possible. And with 3D prototyping, they tend to be so. All right, so talk us through what sort of type of printing is available. Absolutely. Um, so there are many, many different types of printing devices for additive modeling. But the two I'd like to discuss most are the ones that are commercially available uh, that you could go to Sam's Club right now and purchase. And the, the one that most people are familiar with is fused deposition modeling. Uh, example of that are the maker bots that you see whenever you go to one of these um, large big box stores. Uh, they consume about 90%, 96% of the market share. And the basic principle is that you're gonna have a filament which is usually made out of some sort of plastic that's going to be heated and basically melted. And then as it's melted, this extruder is going to lay it down layer by layer on top of this build plate going higher and higher and higher. So you basically your, your X and Y axis is controlled by this head that's being pushed around the platform. And then the Z axis is just from the gradually elevating off the platform. And fused deposition modeling has a couple of advantages. You can have these big volume, big build volumes, so you can make these big structures. It tends to be uh, relatively inexpensive compared to other printers. Um, it's easier, there's not a lot of failures associated with these prints, and it's not very messy. Um, basically, what you see is what you get as far as the product from the table to the product into the hands of the practitioner. So on the bottom left here is an example of a skull that was created by fused deposition modeling. But there's some downsides that you can see um, basically shown in this picture. One of them is that there, it's a lot lower resolution traditionally than other methods. So you could see all those ridges in there. Um, those are basically the layers of plastic that have been laid down. And so finite kind of uh, intricacies will not be as um, possible with this technique. 
another thing is that most of these polymers are not heat resistant. So the idea of autoclaving them or putting through a plasma sterilizer is not as viable. In general, these are not biocompatible. So despite the fact that you can likely touch tissues with them, in general, they're, they're not gonna be, um, they're not gonna be types of materials that you're gonna want long-term in, in contact with a, a biological system. They tend to have shape restrictions and you can see that on the teeth and some of the other protuberances on the skull. You can't make long hanging stalactite like, -like structures. And they also tend to be structurally weaker. So the alternative is actually the original type of printing called stereolithography, which has been since modified and now becoming very popular in the, in the kind of the home commercial field. Um, basically, the way this one works is kind of the opposite. So what you see here in that little diagram is that there is a resin vat that's number nine. And that resin is a photoactivated resin so underneath the resin vat, which has a silicone bottom, so it's clear, a laser shoots up and layer by layer hardens that resin. And then the build platform, which is number four, uh, basically goes into that, every layer peels off, then goes back down, and you have the successive layering, which can lead to these models. And in the top panel, you can see the uh, printer actually working, having these peel effects as that build platform comes away farther and farther from the silicone. But one of the consequences of this technique is not only the mess of dealing with resins, and you can see all the resin all over my printer over there, but it also has to have major scaffolding. There has to be all these supports. So when this uh, technique is completed, there's a lot of post-processing using alcohol to get the extra resin off, using some light to further harder, harden the resin, and also a long process of removing the scaffolding. But the, um, so, so there's some disadvantages with stereolithography. The builds tend to be smaller um, and they tend to be more failure prone because you're dealing with some really delicate things. For example, a, a laser that's shining on a mirror. Uh, and so there's a lot of possibilities for errors. Other possibility for errors are if, uh, if one layer does not get hardened appropriately, the whole thing can fall apart. So the equipment tends to be fragile too. Um, in that if it, if it breaks, you have a big problem. Um, but there's some major advantages. Uh, so one advantage is these high resolution, and you could see in the bottom right panel there, that's a kitten skull that we were able to make, um, which is obviously very, very small. They have gotten less expensive and there's no shape restrictions. Um, and, and with regard to size, there's ways to get around the size. So actually, the, the leg that you're seeing in the bottom left panel and the right panel are the same, just scaled differently. And the way we get around that is making multiple builds and having lock and key mechanisms to hold them together. But I think the real advantage of stereolithography comes in with regard to the resins. You can have resins of different color. So for example, on the top left, there's a multilobular tumor of bone that's been printed in a clear resin so that you could see through the skull. Um, the strengths, there's different strengths and pliability but the most exciting is the potential for biocompatibility. And certainly a lot of these resins have gained certain degrees of FDA approval for biocompatibility. Uh, when it comes to orthodontics, this is the most commonly used technique. Great, so run through then the steps that you uh, would go through um, from start to finish almost of, of how you would create one of these 3D prints. Certainly. Uh, so there's four major steps, particularly when we're talking about the medical field, for particularly when we're talking about in general bone tissue, uh, it's gonna be the acquisition of the um, area of interest or the tissue of interest, the processing of it, the numerical modeling, and then the printing itself. So the acquisition, if we're gonna acquire images, CT is always gonna be the most preferable uh, way of acquiring these images, predominantly because we're really interested in bone. That's going to be the thing that we tend to print the most. And so the contrast resolution of bone is ideal um, on a CT, uh, especially because we can use the density, specifically the Hounsfield units, to look at the bones uh, with the most um, contrast sensitivity possible. CT also has very high spatial resolution, meaning what you see is in, on the CT is where it's supposed to be. So it has a a very high level of model accuracy. 
And it's very easy to create tiny isotropic voxels. Uh, so you can make sub-millimeter voxels that are all the same length, width, width and height. And the value of that is not only did that enable 3D modeling, but also the, the limits or the, uh, the, the resolution that we can create on these prints is not limited by the imaging. Instead, it becomes limited by the printer itself. This is opposed to MRI. People often ask, can you use MRI for imaging these? And it's much more difficult, specifically if you're looking at bone. Uh, so if you're interested in bone, because of the poor contrast resolution of bone on MRI, it's difficult to split out those tissues because that's really what a lot of this is, splitting out those tissues. The, the spatial resolution is also much poorer on MRI. We know that that's part of the reason why radio-oncologists prefer CT over MRI because what you see on the image is actually where it's designated with much more accuracy with CT. Uh, obviously, MRI has more difficulty doing smaller slicing and there's a lot of artifacts associated with MRI, and those artifacts can lead to what are known as manifold defects, which I'll talk about in a moment. So with regard to processing, basically the first step is thresholding. Uh, so what we're gonna do is if we have that tissue that we just looked at, we wanna look at bone, so we're gonna try and use the Hounsfield units to uh, look at the tissue that we're most interested in. Um, then what we're gonna do is do what's known as segmentation, which is remove the tissues that we're not interested in. So for example, if you look at the left side, the top and bottom panel, we don't have an interest in the hyoid apparatus or the endotracheal tube. And so we can remove that. Usually that's done manually, but there's some programmatic components to it that automate it. And then lastly, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a surface rendering of this uh, tissue of interest and export the file in a digital format the most common of which is known as an STL file. So what I tell people is that's really a cool concept of 3D printing is you're, this is no different than a Word or Excel document. You just have a binary information that helps you create a 3D envelope that you can later print. And these files can be very small, anywhere from 10 to 500 megabits. So very easy, easy to share, probably easier to share than this PowerPoint presentation. So. What, I, what this image is showing is what a manifold is. So when we look at the ventral aspect of the cervical spine, what we've really done is taken, the way we've made it into a 3D envelope is we've taken millions and millions of polygons and basically arranged them all together uh, in certain orientations to get the tissue we're most interested in. As you can appreciate, if any one of those polygons is out of place, the whole manifold falls apart. So that's part of the reason for the major processing power and the major accuracy that's required for 3D modeling. Um, so then once we've got our tissue of interest, then we get into the modeling itself. And people say, you know, Fred, can I, can I do this at home? Uh, and, and yes, you know, the easy part is creating an anatomic model, uh, taking it from a CT and putting it on a printer. That's, that's actually not as difficult as it used to be. Um, what becomes more interesting is, and challenging is what can you do with this bone? Can you separate it out? Can you look, cut it in pieces? Can you look at certain areas that you're interested in? And then moving beyond that, can you create implants that interdigitate with it, or rather jigs, tools, and implants that inter interdigitate with it? Now, there's programs that will do that for you. Um, and the, one of the mo most common ones is known as Mimics. Uh, the challenge with that software is that it's uh, usually cost limiting to most people. It's it's at least fifty thousand dollars just to get the base model of it. At least that as when I most recently looked into it. So instead, what we do is we use a lot of these other programs um, that will enable us to do it for free. And my impression from most of these programs, the ones that you see listed on the right, is they kind of fall into one of two categories. Um, the software is either a computer-aided design one, which is similar to what engineers use, or it's more of a um, what mesh, mix, mesh Mixer might be, which is a cartoon-based one, similar to what Pixar would be. And it's kind of neat to try and combine those hard geometric and soft sculpting programs together to kind of accomplish our goals. Mm -hmm. The last step is printing. So what most of these printers have is their own proprietary software, which is uh, creates what's known as a G-code, and basically takes your 
your print of interest, slices it up into layers so that it can print. And, and these some of the printers can print as small as 16 microns. So you can appreciate how high the resolution can be. And print production can be anywhere between an hour to sometimes our prints take as much as 18 hours. But quick question uh, before we get on to this, ne this next section. Um, Fred, you'd mentioned that, um, if, I, if I heard you right, that the quality is more dependent on the printer than the CT acquisition. Um, is, is there a, um, uh, a problem with any specific type of CT unit, uh, one that you, could, you couldn't use versus preferable ones? The, the more yeah. hard ones. Yeah, when it, whenever it comes to any any imaging modality, you know, we're talking about things like signal to noise ratio and also necessary resolution, right? And so um, you're always going to have prettier prints if you get very very uh, small voxels that retain their signal. Um, but what we found is that the general threshold is a millimeter. If you start acquiring um, uh, and trying to print from voxels, isotropic voxels that are larger than a millimeter, you start getting into poor resolution on the prints. Um, but the type of CT, whether it's traditional or cone beam, doesn't seem to make a big difference. Okay, great. Well, thanks for, for clearing that up. Um, or moving on then, I think I think a lot of people will have heard about the 3D printing um, and its use in spinal surgery or for spinal surgery. But can you can you talk now about about that? And uh, obviously, you've got experience in this area that will help help all of our viewers. Yeah, this was. Um, I mean, this is where we start getting into my passion for 3D printing. Um, uh, for the side story is that um, we started using these printing. Uh, well, I'll, I'll share that actually when we get to the skull thing. But you know, the original way that prints have been used is to create 3D prints uh, for anatomic modeling, whether that's for teaching purposes or for challenging uh, surgical approaches. Um, basically, just printing out what we see on the CT. So. Here's an example of a, a dog that had a spinal vertebral anomaly, and uh, what the the surgeon that was most interested in it, or, or that was doing the procedure, essentially asked us to create a print so that she could do the surgery um, with a little bit more a priori knowledge and kind of see it in in a three dimensional kind of means outside of just being on the computer. Um, but then we quickly realized that these animals present us obviously with some anatomic challenges when we're putting in implants because implants have to be safe from the standpoint that they can't pierce neural tissues, they can't pierce the vascular structures that sit underneath them. There's, there's lots of vital things that can't be touched. They have narrow corridors where we can put these implants that enable us to be safe but at the same time effective where these implants are gonna have enough bone stock that they actually provide us with the stability that we need them to. And so we started with uh, doing some thoraco thoraco lumbar implants, excuse me, on um, these vertebral anomalies, but the place where it became most valuable uh, was when we started dealing with the pugs with the constrictive myelopathy and the associated articular facet hypoplasia. Um, and the reason why we felt it was helpful in these animals is we knew we needed to stabilize them, um, but we also knew that their anatomy was small enough and irregular enough that using traditional landmarks to put in implants provided a level of danger uh, that was concerning. And, and, and there's um, definitely a body of evidence uh, to suggest that as good as we are as neurosurgeons, our capacity for putting in implants using traditional means um, leads to significant uh, partial, if not complete, uh, canal violations. And so the way we've used 3D printing is in addition to printing out the spines itself, you can use um, this technology to find a novel surface on the vertebra where a jig or customized surgical tool will interdigitate. And so that's what you're seeing in the bottom left is each one of those little feet uh, is essentially touching a part of the vertebra where there's it's novel there's nowhere else it can fit and then the long cylinders are the ideal trajectory to get through the vertebra uh, achieving both safe and effective implants and then that's just a channel for the drill bits 
So on the top right, you can see pre-planning using a 3D printed spine as a model for these implants. And then I have uh, some surgical images here which show you how these implants can basically uh, be put onto the spine and drilled through. And it's, it's exciting once you start getting some experience and comfort with it, not only does it make the procedures uh, safer, it makes them faster. And you could also argue that it makes your exposure less necessary uh, or wider exposure ne less necessary because now really the exposure that you require is only that such that the uh, jig can contact those novel surfaces. And looking at some of these post-operative images, it gets really exciting to see what these jigs can do because we basically can put very large implants into very narrow corridors that historically would have been very difficult to do. Um, we get almost always bicortical implants and often they cross midline, assuming the anatomy allows us to. Uh, so uh, it's gotten to the point where even some of the neurosurgeons that I've worked with that I think are some of the best neurosurgeons uh, in the world uh, argue that they wouldn't do these procedures without the jigs anymore because of the comfort that it provides them with. Um, the last part of the spinal implants that we wanted to use it was, you know, it's one thing to do it on a solitary single vertebral unit. But when you start, start talking about vertebral motion units where there's movements between the bones um, and doing transarticular implants, things get a little bit more complicated. And obviously the two examples of that would be atlantoaxial malformations and lumbosacral stabilizations. So here's the, on the bottom left is an example of a German shepherd that suffers from uh, lumbosacral syndrome. And we can see in the top middle panel, this is a T2 sagittal image showing the severity of the lumbosacral compression with the degenerative disc disease and all the dorsal compression. And we know that a lot of times we, these are very dynamic lesions and we put these animals in a more flexed position uh, that a lot of the compression associated with those nerve roots is alleviated. So what we've been able to do now is following the MRI, we image these animals with CT. And we used to be very worried about getting these animals into the correct anatomic position to alleviate their compression. But now, because we can digitally separate L7 from S1, we can basically put L7 into the ideal uh, anatomic position uh, dorsally so that those articular facets match up ideally. And then on the bottom right, you can see what, that we can create jigs that will not only uh, stabilize those articular uh, or those transarticular uh, screws, but we also can make jigs that put sometimes very challenging L7 pedicular screws and sacral screws in place. So here's just an example on the left of the jig in place for an L7 S1 stabilization. And then you can see those implants have been placed. And then on the right, again, sometimes these CTs really just kind of, um, they're just exciting to see because you see the accuracy with which these implants have been placed um, relative to the uh, neural tissues. Great, well, very visual, Fred, thank you for, for that. That's take away a lot of the uh, post-operative imaging concerns at uh, that time of um, stress, I think. Um, yeah. So the, um, m moving forward, uh, uh, I think probably people are less aware about the advantages of, of 3D printing for skull surgery. So um, let us know what, what, you're, what you're doing with that. Yeah, again, it's a very similar um, kind of initial approach. So the initial approach was we, got, we have these large skull tumors, we have skull trauma. Um, can we put the skull in our hands so that we can prepare for surgery more comfortably? And so on the bottom right, you can see an example of a chihuahua that was bit on the skull and it had a large frontal bone fracture. We felt it was to our advantage to print it out and, and see it before doing the surgical approach. And on the top right, um, another advantage of it is that we're using 3D prints to aid us with more advanced uh, navigation tools like neuro navigation. So that's an example of a, an implant printed specifically for that dog for a uh, neuro navigation 
uh, ventricular injection. So those were kind of the initial reasons that we had used it. But the, my first entry into uh, using it for more than that was actually using it on the cat of a 3D engineer at Washington University uh, with this meningioma. So uh, what you're seeing on the left here is a CT MR fusion of a very large meningioma. Now, traditionally what you'd have to do for a procedure like this is do a very, very, either a very, very large craniotomy to get it all out, not knowing exactly what your landmarks would be, though you would measure on the skull, of course, or you would have to use a neuronavigation device similar to a brain site. But what you, we started doing is we realized that we could use this 3D equipment like you're seeing in the middle to identify the part of the skull that would need to be removed uh, to get the ideal meningioma removal. And that would enable us to get the ideal borders without taking too much. And then from there, we created what you see in the top right, which is a craniotomy jig. And so we, if we put that on the skull of the animal and we outlined it, we would know the necessary craniotomy to create. And then we also used that 3D printed skull to preform a titanium plate, which would cover the craniotomy defect. Because if you've ever tried to put one of these plates on intraoperatively, you'll know how challenging it could be to contour it in surgery. Uh, so here are just some surgical images. You could see in the top left, the craniotomy jig in place. Uh, in the top uh, or in the uh, second panel from the top left, you see that we've used a surgical marker to outline the ideal craniotomy based on the jig. Uh, the bottom left panel is going to be the meningioma removal. And then the bottom of uh, the second to left bottom panel is going to be placing that uh, that implant in. And um, this cat did very well, as we all know, um, meningioma removals can go. Uh, another case that was more challenging for us was this dog that had this very large osteolytic mass of the frontal bone. And it had uh, it basically this large uh, palpable mass over the top of the skull. So we, again, used the 3D print not only to identify where we should basically put this, um, put the uh, implant or rather make the craniotomy, but also how we can contour the implant. And this was the next evolution of it because as opposed to the cat, we had to modify the skull and remake the skull so that it was normal for the implant uh, contouring. And so that's what we've done here. And you can see the cosmetic uh, potential associated with the implant. But the, the ultimate kind of way that we've taken this, and I have some props for later ones, so I'm not sharing the screen, was when we started having masses that were not only so large that they necessitated the jig, but also masses that were so large that there is no titanium implant available to cover it. And so what you're looking at here is a young uh, puppy that had a large benign osteoma, but the, it's far from benign in the amount of brain compression that it's causing, as you can see. And so in the bottom panel, in the middle, you can see the printing of the tumor and how much into the cranial vault it extended. And then in the top right, you're seeing the original skull, as well as a representation of the skull as if we had removed the external components of the tumor. Most excitingly on the bottom right, what you're seeing is a 3D printed cranioplasty created specifically for this dog. Now, it's important to uh, mention that this resin that was used is what's known as a dental SG resin, and it is a FDA approved resin, uh, which is considered biocompatible for surface contact. It has not been FDA approved for implantation. So this is an off label use for this implant, but because of the challenges associated with any other option, the owner was willing to allow us to use this implant off label. And um, the surgery went very well. Uh, we were able to place that implant. We've imaged the dog four months later, and there's not only no signs of regrowth, but no signs of reaction uh, to the implant. And so we've actually performed this on two 
other dogs, um, both of which had benign osteomas, which is, as we all know, a bit unusual. Um, but we're using this technique more and more. Other uses for skull um, 3D printing, really the uses are endless, uh, but on the top left, what you're seeing is we've created some 3D custom clips for ventriculoperitoneal shunts. There was uh, recently a discussion on the ACVIM listserv about the challenges of uh, ventriculoperitoneal shunt placement. And uh, now we can make customized tools that not only hold the shunt in place uh, more permanently, but also position them into the correct position in the skull. And then some more fun things, we can use them as external prosthetics as well. So this was a Yorkshire Terrier that had a very severe caudal fossa skull fracture. Um, we didn't want to attempt surgery on it because the dog was clinically doing well enough that it didn't require it, but we wanted to create something to protect it given that that kind of uh, occiput was flapping in the breeze. And so we created a customized helmet for this patient. Um, and while I don't have video of it, the owner reports that the dog prefers to run around with the helmet on than off, which is kind of fun. So obviously uh, there's other applications for it as well. Wow, fantastic. Um, a lot of people are gonna be sat um, wondering if, if this is something they can use in, in their practice. Um, can you talk us through how, how that would naturally occur? Yeah, definitely. So I, um, I, I think that there's two ways that 3D printing can be considered and used for the and used for just general veterinary medicine. You know, I think the applications are endless, and the more we get into more biocompatible technologies and ones that integrate into our tissues, things get even more exciting. And now we're talking about um, even biomechanical resins, so that we can start. Uh, putting in implants. And, and one of the things that comes to mind always is the ideal wobbler implant, uh, where you can basically put a 3D print into the intervertebral space, which will not only serve as a strut and a distractor, but also a stabilizer. I think it's important to recognize that with 3D prints, it's a team approach. And you need someone with both clinical skills and also the engineering skills. Um, People often ask me about getting a printer, and I say getting a printer is great, but the, the challenge is not just printing out bone. The challenge is creating tools that enable you to do better, and, and that takes a little bit of skill along with it. So there's two ways of thinking about this work envelope. The first is to get acquire the CT, um, and then you basically take that information, you put it into the cloud, and you start the modeling process. And I would potentially be the one starting the modeling process. And at present, I print it and I send you the print that you're interested in. I think the eventual um, evolution of this is that everyone has a printer at their desktop and they recognize that the printing process is not difficult, it's just the creation process. So you send me, for example, a CT, I model the ideal thing for you that you're interested in, and then I email it to you, no, no different than a Microsoft Word attachment or a PDF, you have it on your computer seconds later as it goes over email, and then you print it out bedside. Um, I think that's really where we're headed. We've used um, some other things to consider with 3D printing is we've used it for surgical instruction. Uh, we're exploring the use of it with um, my resident, Liz Curtis. We're exploring the use of it for potential biomechanical testing. So instead of having to get cadavers, uh, you're gonna basically have a universally uh, con use control um, spine that you can do biomechanical testing on. And we've even done, done it for some promotional things where we want to pass out a bone with the name of a hospital on it. Um, and uh, it's been used for that function as well. Basically, if you're interested in this type of printing, you would take the tissue of interest and acquire submillimeter or at least millimeter uh, CT acquisition. Um, you would save it to a Dropbox, and if you were going to use uh, our services, you would send it to 3dveterinaryprinting at gmail.com through Dropbox. I would model it. Uh, turnaround time is generally less than a week until I ship you the products, and cost tends to be between $250 and $350 for the implants that we create. Um, and the variability there is the size and complexity, as well as the resin choice. Um, another thing that uh, I really like to do is find out what the goals of the clinician are 
And we usually do that through a digital Zoom consultation and we can actually share a screen and model the jig that you're most interested in together. And that way, if you had a certain trajectory or a certain corridor that you felt would be better for some of these surgical instruments, or if there was a certain, for example, if we were doing a craniotomy jig and there was a certain structure or tissue that you wanted to avoid, we could, we could figure that out together. Uh, although I work with many neurosurgeons all over the world, I actually work more with orthopedists. Um, and in the middle panel there, what you can see is that we use this technology to create wedge osteectomies um, for angular limb deformities, and it really has made their lives a lot easier, um, not only in the planning stages, but in the procedural place, pages, places. Excuse me. Um, if you're interested in some of the things that we're doing, we have a Facebook page, 3dveterinaryprinting.com, uh, or uh, on Facebook. Our website's kind of being revamped, and um, we also I also feature it on my um, Instagram, uh, Animal Neurodoc, but we also have a 3D veterinary printing Instagram as well. So I can be contacted usually through email, but direct message through either of those social media networks is possible too. Wow, Fred, I, I anticipate you're going to be getting very busy, a lot busier. Um, That's why I hope so. After this. Thanks. Um, I, no, I, I, I'm going to pass you over to Laurent in a second, but I really want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to do this. As, as much reading as people can do in this area, um, I think it's such a visual area and it, de it demands someone like yourself with the experience that, that you have helping out reading through the areas of, 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 of difficulty. And, uh, and I think that's been invaluable for us. I'm sure a lot of people watching uh, will will agree. So thanks very much for, for that. Really appreciate it. Um, That's my pleasure. I'm so I'm so I'm so uh, grateful to have this kind of opportunity to share it with everybody. So thanks. No, good, great job. I'll pass you over to Laurent. I'm sure he's got a, a couple of questions yeah, for you. Got quite a few questions, but thanks a lot, uh, Fred. I mean, um, we always say, you know, don't go to surgery without a plan. Um, without thinking of what could happen, what you're going to do about it, but that takes the planning to another level, I will say. And uh, I'm sure Simon will agree with me. You know, how many times you finish a surgery, you wait for the X-ray in anticipation. In the old days, we didn't have digital. We were waiting for the X-ray to come out of the, the machine, yeah. even, you know, pulling them because, you know, you're sweating so much to see yeah. if the implant are in the right place. But with that, it obviously... Uh, make it you know more comfortable i would say and you didn't see simon but he was getting quite excited when you mentioned about denture as well uh, but you can do 3d printing denture and uh, so you know I, I think that suddenly you open a new perspective for him as well so oh Laurent, i mean you can you can laugh about age no one no one watching knows what you're talking about with developing x-rays and lifting it out <laughs> The you are in the same era, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so, moving on, there is a few questions. Um, have you considered, Fred, titanium laser sintered implant instead of SLA implant that could be potentially toxic, at least in yeah. zebrafish? Yes. Um, so that's a great question. So I've worked uh, certainly with higher end printers like uh, that do things like laser sintering, as well as some peak producing. Um, which is a type of plastic that's biocompatible uh, printers. Um, one of the reasons why I didn't present that here is because they're cost limiting uh, to many veterinarians and the implants themselves therefore become cost limiting. In addition to the fact that the turnaround time in acquiring those implants can be so long that it prevents us from using them clinically as well. So one of the goals when we started working with 3D printing was to find print technology that was accessible, affordable, and timely. Um, the, that said, the technology is moving so quickly, um, including now uh, with um, residentially available uh, nylon implants um, using bonding techniques, uh, that yes, I think that eventually using, um, using materials which are more biocompatible um, and also have stronger biomechanical properties, <clears throat> excuse me, will be, um, will be the printing methodology of, methodology of choice. Um, with regard to the toxicity of these implants, I mean, most of these resins that are used with stereolithography are a type of methacrylate. They are potentially toxic if they're not completely cured 
um, but their toxicity goes down significantly once cured. And so I also don't think with the technology changing as it is, that it's gonna be far off before we have these resins that are completely biocompatible. Just a quick question on that is more, um, when your, the veterinarian that ordered the, the 3D printing receive it from you, what's the best method to actually sterilize them? What do you use for that? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, obviously, so the, less, the least um, dangerous for the implant or, or product is gonna be uh, ethylene oxide but it's also the most dangerous for the people around it. So we use plasma when we're using an SLA implant and haven't had any challenges associated with it. If we are using more fused deposition modeling, uh, that wouldn't be as possible. But you advise your client to use ethylene oxide. Okay. Yes, um, often we will actually do that for them. We will sterilize it and then send it okay. sterile. Uh, so you for send their it use. sterile to them? Yeah. Okay. Um, there is uh, from Steph, um, any I mean, you can see the question, any recommendation of where you can get more practice, how to get into 3D printing, and um, yeah, I think it's to develop, you know, the, the technique to the future generation. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I, I was afforded an excellent opportunity when I was in St. Louis because of the access I had to the WashU lab. Um, uh, colleague and friend and client, his name is Nick Thompson, taught me a lot and audited some courses there as well. Um, 3D printing courses are becoming more available, but not necessarily in the medical field. So it's a lot of uh, personal learning. Um, I think that with the, if you can afford the more expensive software, the learning curve is a lot less as opposed to the free software where you have to get very creative. Um, so I think that's part of, I, I, I actually, I guess what I'm trying to suggest is at the moment, there's really not a lot of formal training in it. It's really more a self-taught thing Absolutely. and it, it takes time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question. Um, do you control depth sometime with the drill guide combined with a stop on the drill bit? Yes. So we certainly have done that. Um, it's not hard to do. You just have, need to know the length of the drill bit or um, at least have a drill bit that's short enough that you can change it. Obviously with a quick stop, it's a little bit more difficult than it is with a traditional one. Um, but we also have found that you don't need it as much uh, because we're doing mostly implants that we want to cross through both cortices. If we are doing monocortical screws, I, I could see a greater advantage to the depth or the con control depth. Um, but that's really the beauty of the 3D prints is now we don't have to rely on monocortical implants. We can get implants with greater purchase through multiple cortices. And I think there was just one last. Um, you kind of cover it, but just to reiterate any special setting when you do the, the CT or, you know, you don't the CT suddenly realize you need to do the 3D printing, any CT will do. Yeah, any CT will do. Um, Obviously a bone window would be preferable if we're looking at bone, um, but really the size and isotropic nature of the voxels is what's most important. Okay. And last, last one, but I wanted to ask you, when you got to severe subluxation, like atlantoaxial, obviously the CT is going to take the picture in luxation. Does your computer program allow you to you know, put the to to a real line and then to do the printing on the real line bone because it must be yeah. quite complex to make planning exactly so there's two options for transarticular implants one option which is ideal is to put the animal into position that's ideal when you take the image set so for example if you were doing a lumbosacral to put them in a flex position when you acquire the images or a lot of times with atlantoaxial subluxations, as we all know, if you put the animals in a little bit of extension and a little bit of traction, you can actually reduce them manually. If that, if you can accomplish it that way, then there's no degree of digital processing that's required. But otherwise, yes, we can move the bones into ideal position. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can actually achieve that in, in real surgical space. Um, the other point of transarticular screws is there's two methods. One method is to find novel surfaces on both the cis and trans bone and make the jig catch both, therefore reducing it. 
Um, but those have a very tight fit and they don't always work as well in surgery. So what we found to be better is have an implant which grabs the cis bone or the near bone and then reduce it into the ideal position knowing that it's going to hit the trans bone because of the way you've oriented things. Mm -hmm. uh, much easier in the LS than in the AA where not only are you dealing with the cranial caudal, but you're also dealing with the dorsal vent ventral yeah, subluxation. The main, uh, the main issue, indeed. Um, Fred, thanks a lot again. It was fascinating. Um, really take, again, the, the neurosurgery to another level in, in terms of planning. Um, I just want to reiterate that you know your company is called Free Divinary Printing, and you do this kind of service for any vet around the world. So you know, feel free to contact you know Fred if you want you know to get advice, and also if you want to uh, order one of these um, you know surgical guide. You can see that Fred has a lot of experience you know in in that. Um, before to finish, just wanted to you know let you know what we've got in uh, plan for next week. Next week will be the last of our um, uh, uh, Facebook Live. Um, we've got um, a few ideas after that, which I will share in a minute. Um, next week, we've got uh, a fantastic speaker and a very um, experienced uh, anesthetist, Louise Clark. Simon and I, we have both worked with Louise uh, for many years, and she's an excellent teacher as well. She will discuss with us problem solving in neuroanesthesia, how to identify when there is a problem and what to do about it. Um, I specifically asked Louis, um, but can get very enthusiastic about neuroanesthesia to make it um, really uh, 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 accessible for people like Simon and I, which we know absolutely nothing about anesthesia. So that's the level she will aim you know, for. And after that, what we're planning to do, um, just wanted to announce you um, today, we're going to stop doing this uh, Facebook Q&A, but we're planning to do a monthly journal club um, via, you know, our Facebook site where we will invite um, the author of a recently published paper and we will go through the paper uh, with that author and we're going to start at the end of, of June. So um, it will be a live journal club, um, but you will be also able to ask directly questions to the author and in between, we'll do regular neuroimaging round as well. So we will have two events a month from now on. Um, Fred, thanks again for your Thank time. You. I'm sure you're very busy um, yeah. the, for joining us. Simon, I'll, I'll let you say the last word as well. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Fred, again. Um, yeah, invaluable, your experience in uh, using all of those visual aids to help us try and understand uh, what we've struggled to read um, and really, really pushing neurosurgery forward. So uh, appreciate your time. Thank, thanks so much for that. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. And uh, see you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.